Uh, I really, for most of us, do not need to introduce Brother Charles, but that's never kept anybody from trying to anyway. I always hear that somebody say that, you know, he needs no introduction, and then they proceed to introduce him for 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try not to do that. Brother Charles is a spiritual father, a uh, pastoral leader, a teacher of the word, uh, a, a spiritual mentor and pastor to our own Brother John and Ellen and Curtis and Phyllis, uh, and has been a part of our lives for so many years. I don't even want to recount. Uh, I, in particular, am very blessed that Brother Charles um, ordained me. He prayed over me and my wife during our wedding and actually did our wedding, uh, spoke prophetic words over us that there were days didn't know those were going to come to pass. But I think we can see that God's word remains forever. And his word is settled, and it is coming to pass. We are very grateful for his place in our lives, and it's always a privilege to have him here with us. Uh, we count him not only as a friend, but as a spiritual father to this community. We're very grateful for you, Brother Charles. Please come, and would you welcome Charles Simpson. Wow. Thank you. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your presence and for your promises and for your people. We thank you for such abundance. I pray you'll help us today to express our gratitude in our lives and in our love for one another. I thank you, Father, for those that gave their lives so we can have your living word. We thank you, Father, for those that defended our freedom so we could declare it. We thank you for those whose names we may never know who gave all. Help us, Lord, to love you that way and to leave a, a legacy worthy of your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be here. It always is. I, I uh, should record all the kind words and play them sometimes to listen to myself. Um, but I, I'm just grateful to God. I, I don't take myself seriously, by the way. And uh, people who know me know that's true. And the older you get, I wish I had loved old people more when I was a kid. Uh, and I've, now I love old people jokes. <laughs> old couple's laying in bed, and guy was about to sleep, and his wife said, you don't love me like you used to. And he rolled over and said, why do you say that? She said, you used to tell me you love me. He said, well, I love you. And he thought he was about ready to get to sleep again. And she said, well, she said, you used to hug me. And he rolled over and hugged her. And he went back to sleep just about it. And she said, you used to nibble my ear. So he got out of bed. She said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to get my teeth there in the bathroom. <laughs> so it... Uh, It's funny to you young people, anyway. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to be old. Uh, I'm glad uh, that God uh, has helped us. And uh, every day, we're grateful for it. Uh, and I love the church. And I never come here that I don't remember Brother John, who was as close to me as anybody, and a great friend for many years. and. Brother Curtis, we appreciate him. He was there um, right at the beginning. And I appreciate people that know you all their lives and don't say anything about the things you'd rather them not say anything about. And uh, maybe it's because they forgot. Anyway, I hope so. But I appreciate love and appreciate him. And many of you, Roger, people that have been around a while, I, I respect that. I'm grateful for the worship, uh, and I appreciate it when 
songs are sung that flow with the message God's given you or prayers are prayed that flow with the message that God has given you. And I'm going to read a number of scriptures, more than normal, more than I usually do. And I invite you to read with me. I want to talk to you about enduring hope. Enduring hope. We tend to uh, minimize hope. Um, love, the first Corinthians 12, 13 says, now abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And of course, love gets all the attention and, and is worthy, of course. But um, hope is also very important because it's the stuff of endurance if your hope is enduring. And I, I believe we live in a time when many people are losing hope. And they've lost something they believed in. Martin Gurry wrote a book called The Revolt of the Public and studied revolutions, came from Cuba himself, worked for the CIA, and said, began to study revolutions, going back to the French Revolution, and said the seedbed of revolution is cynicism, nihilism, lost hope. And uh, he's not for revolution, by the way, but he's very concerned about our country. There are a lot of indicators that suicide and other problems, psychological problems, are increasing because of a lost hope. And I... Um, well, I have to be careful. I, I'll go where I really don't want to go. But I want to read uh, from Psalm 27, and I'll just read verse 5, and then I'm going to, um, well, I'll tell you, I'll go to Job first. I'll go to Job 14, 7, and then maybe Psalm 27. In Job 14, 7, there's hope for a tree, for if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease, though the root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. At the scent of water, how many of you know the Lord's presence is like the scent of water? He rejuvenates us. I um, I want to I, I want to go to Lamentations, the third chapter, and read uh, from there, uh, verse twenty through twenty six. I, I just finished reading Lamentations, and uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Lamentations is a tough book. Um, if, you, if you're looking for inspiration, you probably don't go to Lamentations. Uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations are talking about the destruction of Israel and the great tragedies that the people were going to go through. And then in the midst of it, uh, in Lamentations, the third chapter, in verse um, 20, he said, My soul still remembers and sinks or bows within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. I remember things that bring me hope, even though it's a bad time. In my memory, I remember something that gives me hope. Through the Lord's mercies, and the word there is kessed, which is covenant. It's not just mercy, it's covenant mercy. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The word wait gives me a problem. I don't know about you, but waiting is not my gift. But we have to learn to wait on the Lord because 
he's in control of the timing and what is going to happen. Uh, I want to go back to Jeremiah 29, um, and I'd like to read verse 11. A lot of us use this verse for encouragement. It gets quoted a lot. Verse 11, Jeremiah 29, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I'd like to go on reading, but I'm going to cease. I'm going to go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Now, I'm just scratching the surface of what the scripture says about hope, but I want to establish my thoughts on the word of God. Romans 5, I'll read from verse 5 and read five verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through whom also we have access, access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tri we glory, did you get that? We glory in tribulations. I don't know if, don't shout me down because you love it so much. We glory in tribulations, knowing, if we know, that tribulation produces perseverance or endurance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope, that, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I'll go one more. Um, my, my, my. I'll go Romans 8 while we're in the neighborhood, and I will read verse 28 and 29. A lot of quotes on this. Romans um, Twenty-eight, And we know that all things, say all things with me, all things. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. All things work together for our good and are designed to conform us to the image of Christ. We have a problem in our country, and that is a lot of people have no hope. My daughter and children are in Costa Rica. Kids were locked down for almost two years. I don't think we have any concept of what that does to children. Uh, the loss of socializing, friends, uh, getting locked in a room uh, with a computer, what studying you do, and the loss of a year or two of your educational life, loss of your life. The devastating toll is more than we know and probably we'll find out more about it in years to come. There are all kinds of difficulties that are affecting people and affecting their hope. Real hope is an anticipation of a positive outcome. It's anticipating something good is going to happen. The problem is if, if that doesn't happen and if those kinds of things continue to happen, you can lose your hope. The key is to put your hope in the right place to start with. And I love the song, I love the hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. All of the ground, not some other ground, but what? 
All of the ground is sinking sand when darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. And I love this line. I love boating and used to do a lot of it. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Now, if you know anything about boating, you need a good anchor. Because when storms come, if you can't make it to the other side, you drop your anchor and hope it digs in and holds the bow into the seas. And I've been there and done that. Thank God for an anchor that holds. I could get stuck on that part of the topic. But what happens is a lot of people drift in the storm. And life is full of storms. I appreciate positivity. And uh, I don't appreciate negativity, but there are storms in life. And there are things we have to deal with. And sometimes they're high and stormy gales. And we need an anchor that holds so that we don't broach in the middle of the storm. We're not overcome by the tempest and the waves, which can really happen. Real hope is a wonderful thing. But the context for it can be terrible. What I have read to you about hope in this morning was written in a terrible context. All of it. It was written in bad times, lamentations. He said, but I remember and I find hope. I, 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 I just, uh, I love Jeremiah. He says, I, I know the plans that I have for you, and it's good, and I'm going to give you an expected end. But right before that, it says, after 70 years of captivity. Yeah, I don't hear a lot of quotes on that verse. <laughs> we like to leave out the nasty part. But thank God for a hope that works in the nasty part. That enables endurance. When the Apostle Paul is writing Romans and he talks about the hope there that makes us endure, he's talking about suffering and tribulation. You know the fastest growing church in the world right now? He said, I ran. I can't think of a more unlikely place for the church to grow. They don't do church like we do, it's all relational. They have to depend on the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I think the time is coming when we are going to need to depend on the Lord more than we do now. When trust is going to be more than a phrase or a word, it's going to be our hope. We need to get into that now where we realize he is our hope in every context. When all around our soul gives way. We're not surprised by a bad context. We're not shocked when life presents a storm. We're not, we're not saying, but if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to have that kind of garbage. We're not saying that. Because we live the same life. We have to live the same life that the rest of humanity has to live. And there's ups and downs, hills and valleys. But there is a difference when we get into a valley, we have something unshakable that brings us back up the mountain. We don't die in the valley. I like what David said, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me. He's going to the table that God's prepared for him, but he's got to get through this shadow of death. I... I I'm sure you don't need what I'm saying, but you know somebody that does. There are people out there that are in terrible situations. In Psalm 27, David said, um, he said, One thing have I desired in the Lord, of the Lord, and that will I seek after I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. A great statement. I love Psalm 27 came to me in a time of difficulty. But the verse before that says, when my enemies, even my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh. 
I felt led to go to the house of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? It's, uh, man said, I felt led. That's what he was said. That's what he said when he was shot with a shotgun. Sometimes we have to feel led before we flee into the house of the Lord. And before we get really, really serious. Well, in bad situations, it's inventory time. It's inventory. Say it with me. It's inventory. Let's say it with gusto. It's inventory time. Now, I, I suppose everybody knows what inventory time is. I hated inventory time. I worked in a store. And um, inventory time, Charles, you got to go through everything on the shelf and write it down and the cost and go through the whole <laughs> cotton-picking store. And uh, I don't like inventory time. I want to just go on. I don't even like to clean out my closet, let alone inventory time. <laughs> oh, my. I hate it when the spirit of confession comes on me in the pulpit. <laughs> inventory time. You mean you want me to go through my life and what I do every day and where I'm focused and what's going on and, 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 and take an account of that? Well, I don't have time for that. I've got a lot of things to do. No, when it gets really bad and you don't have a whole lot to do, it's time to sit down and see what's happening. Where are we? It's time to take stock. It's time to assess what we have and what we don't have and what we thought we had. It's time to decide what are we going to purchase in the future. Hey, this stuff's been sitting here and, and it hasn't sold. It's got dust on the package. Let's don't buy any more of that. This, we can hardly keep it in stock. Let's buy more of this. Inventory time is when you decide how to adjust your investments. It's not good if you wait till you're old to take inventory. The earlier you take it. In fact, inventory was an annual event. It's good if it's more often than that. It's inventory time. It's inventory in our country. People will get all excited about something that blows away. It's time to sit down and ask yourself, what in my life is going to endure? What's going to still be there? What relationships I have are going to be with me? Who can I really depend on? What is just froth and words that I don't need to invest in? What is helping me to grow and build and What's tearing me down? It's inventory time. You know, it's good if you let the Holy Spirit help you with inventory. If you let him go over it with you and say, look at that and look at that and look at that. My, I wish I had taken inventory more often than I did. You know, the thing is, other people are taking inventory <laughs> On you. Anyway, I'll move on from that. Uh, we can all critique where somebody else is. <laughs> it's a gift. <laughs> I've always had the gift of suspicion <laughs> and criticism. I had that before I was saved. It was just a natural gift. <laughs> I mean, you build it up, I can tear it down. All right. But we need to take inventory. I, I appreciate uh, Brother Roger was praying about staying in our lane. I, I, that's a phrase I've been using a lot. Lord, help me to stay in my lane. I'm good at managing other people's business. Um, <laughs> I'm the older brother. I really am. I mean, I've got had younger siblings. And I, it was my job. And when they grew up, I kept it up. 
Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I hate saying all that. Anyway, um, but it's just easy. I mean, you can see it. Why can't they see it? <laughs> I'm a pathological advice giver. I mean, I can walk up to a stranger and give him good advice. You know, the <laughs> I know nobody. Maybe you're laughing because that's hitting you in your place. I don't know. But um, my, my, my. It's inventory time. I, uh, my father knew me and loved me anyway. And... Uh, he said one time, he said, son, you need to leave some problems for God to solve. And uh, I wish I'd have heard it better, but I had that temperament of solving other people's problems. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't have Facebook when I was a kid. <laughs> So me. <laughs> Stay in your own lane. Leave some things for God to solve. I love the old spiritual. It's not my brother and my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, that's standing in the need of prayer. Let's do inventory with God. Let's let the Holy Spirit come in and say, Charles, you got a little more time. You could be spending more profitably than the way you're spending it. Um, you need to forgive that person. You need to stop holding on to that. Um, you need to let your relationship be more important than your opinion. Well, what do we do? What do we do in this time? My soul still remembers. I, I love to remember the great things that it, I love history. And I was talking with someone about the Hebrides revival. 1949, off the coast of Scotland, how the power of God fell. I love to remember that. In 1965, when uh, our church was going through its transition, I invited a couple who had been in that revival to speak to our church in Mobile, and they shared some of the things that happened. Powerful. The church was dying, and uh, young people weren't coming. The older people were passing on. Church was dead. And there were four deacons that were praying every morning in the barn for the church, and there were two old ladies who could no longer go to church because of their health. So they agreed just to pray together for the church. And one morning, these four men were in the barn about 4.30 praying about the church. And a young man read the Psalms, and he said, Lord, have I lifted up my soul to vanity? Do I have clean hands and a pure heart? And reading about David's statement, and the Holy Spirit fell in the barn. The glory of God came in. And it moved to the church. And they invited Duncan, oh, what's his name, from, from Scotland, mainland, to come and preach. And the church began to fill up. And uh, people got saved and filled with the Spirit. And, and one night, the sheriff sent to the church and said, there's a group gathered down here at the jail, and they're asking for a preacher. And so he went to the jail, and he said on the way to the jail, people were in the ditch beside the road on their knees crying out to God. You can't make that happen. 
There's no program in the world that will bring that kind of conviction and release upon people. But the Holy Spirit can. When I remember, I remember the Shantung revival it happened before my birth. But back in the early 30s, the power of the Holy Spirit fell in China. And I had the privilege of interviewing a man who was there. Dr. John Abernathy, he was a Baptist missionary in China when the Holy Spirit fell. He later became second vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Old man with a full head of gray hair. His wife sat over in the corner as he recounted to me and another Baptist pastor who was a moderator of our association because I was being investigated over the work of the Spirit. So I brought my friend, Q.T. Curtis, who was moderator of the association, and we had played golf. We were good friends together. And I invited him to the interview as I sat and talked to Dr. Abernathy. And he began to tell the miracles that happened. He was a Baptist. He said a man was raised from the dead. He said they were building his coffin and they called for him to come and pray and God raised him up. And he went on and on and on. And I said, Dr. Abernathy, did anybody speak in tongues in that revival? He said, thousands. He said, people were healed, delivered. This is in 1931, 32, 33. When I remember, I find hope. When I remember the great reformations, the power of God, Pentecost, the things that have happened in the past, when people were taken out of their natural limitations. What do we do? Well, let's remember that God has done great things. I love the song. In bad times, that's what leads up to revival. It's when, it's when all around our souls give way. It's in the Great Depression. It's in oppression. It's in the loss of all kinds of, you know, God has to destroy a lot of things before he can build what he wants to build. He told Jeremiah, I've called you to tear down and build up. But you got to tear down some things before you build up. Because some things you build, if you build on the wrong foundation, as it says in Matthew 7, if you build on the sand, there's coming a storm. I've got relatives in South Louisiana, and they can tell you about building on a poor foundation. When the waves come in, high as the eve of your house, when the whole area looks like it's part of the Gulf of Mexico, you want to be sure you're built right and built in the right place. And there are times in life when the waves are high, and the winds are high. Let's remember. He says, wait patiently. You know, you can't make God move when you want him to. I love to get it done. I love to go to point A to point B as fast as possible. And I've got a record to prove it. I, I don't like to mess around. Let's get it done and move on to something else. But God's not like that. A day with the Lord's. A thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. <laughs> but Lord, you got to do something. Uh, I may be dead before you decide to do something. <laughs> Doesn't seem to bother him. The, the, you know, he's got a time. He's got a time. Way patient. Don't, <laughs> don't nag the Lord. Ask him. But then wait on him. The Bible says in another place, wait quietly. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to move on because I'll confess more stuff. Anyway, and then it says, seek diligently. He said, you will, this, this, this is all in Lamentations. 
Seek diligently, like you're looking for a treasure. Seek the Lord. It's not about getting him to do what you want him to do. It's about seeking him and wanting to know him. In the fellowship, Paul says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable to his death. It doesn't sound like a bigger car and better house to me. He may give you one, but it's about him. Search your ways. You have clean hands and a pure heart. Have you lifted up your soul to vanity? As David says. Well, it's good to have unshakable hope. Being a pastor, you get phone calls. A friend of mine called me. He couldn't talk on the phone. He called me. He could dial, but he couldn't talk. All I could hear him say was, I said, Billy, are you okay? I said, don't try to talk. Hang up. I'll pray for you. His wife had it too. <clears throat> when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. God raised him up, raised his wife up too. Sometimes people pass away in the providence of God. But... One guy does a lot of things around our area, and he's a contractor. He's Brother Charles. I need to talk to you. He said, I feel hopeless. He said, I'm better than this. I don't understand. But he had a brother who lost his wife and, and different things going on in his family with his kids and he said, I don't know why I feel. He's, not, he's an upbeat kind of guy. Tough kid. Grown man now, but tough. He said, I feel hopeless. I could go on with this. I don't want to depress you, but there are people out there that are in trouble. And they see no way out. If you're not one of those, and I pray you're not, thank God, but you've got something for that person, you can point them to the rock. You can say, there is a place of hope that endures and doesn't fade away. He says, let's lift our hearts and our hands to God in thanksgiving. And then he says in the third chapter of Lamentations again, he says, do not fear. What are you talking about, do not fear? You just got through saying the whole place is going to be burned down and all the leaders are going to be carried away into captivity. And you said, don't fear? Isn't it amazing how God can give you peace in a storm? He can quiet the seas. In your heart. One more thing. If you want the favor of God. I, I love Ezekiel 9. He told his angel. said I want you to go through the city. And put a mark on all those that sigh and cry. For the sins of my people. And when the storm comes. They will last. They will stand. I will take care of them. God loves it when you intercede. For the nation, for the city. When you pray for righteousness, when you pray that sin and rebellion will be put down, you're 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 in tune with God. He wants to do that. So 
remember what God has done. Wait patiently for what he will do. Seek him diligently because it's about him and not what we want or the predictions and all that stuff. It's about him. Take inventory. Search your own ways. Let other people handle theirs. Handle your own. And hope. Quietly wait on the Lord. Lift your heart and hands to God and don't be afraid and pray for your city and the nation. The word encourage means to put heart into. And he says, the apostle says, don't forsake to get together and encourage one another. Hope can come from fellowship. I love fellowship. I love fellowship. I just spent a few days with three other pastors who've gone through a, a whole lot. And we had wonderful fellowship, sharing life together. We played a couple of rounds of golf, and I lost most of my hope. But anyway, I'm sorry. We, uh, we played a couple of rounds of golf. And, uh, but we would come and fellowship and, and go back to the cabin and pray and, and, and talk and Share life. Don't, don't forget to share life with your family and your friends and one another and be encouraged. I would, I'm going to stop because of time, but in Hebrews 10, he talks about enduring by hope. Hope makes us endure when others give up you will still be there enduring if you don't lose your hope and you won't lose your hope if you put it in the right place first samuel 30 says david's enemies came and stole his family and their goods and they were off in a battle and they got back, and everything had been taken, including their wives. And his men got so mad at him, they wanted to stone him. And the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Well, we can too. Thank you. <laughs>